All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this press briefing on what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. As always, we want to start off by reminding people about our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy. Stay home. Don't take unnecessary trips outside the household. That's important to slowing things down. Number two, work, but work from home if you can. And if you go into the workplace, work in a socially distanced way. You know, try and keep that six foot distance. You know, carpool with only household members. If you're gonna carpool with other people, have just two people, one in the front, one in the back, both with masks. Uh, make sure that you're avoiding groups of 10 people or more. All that sort of thing is gonna be good for remembering those social distancing guidelines while you're working. Number three, shop once a week. Just get in and get out. Have a list. Be efficient. Do not take the entire family with you when you go shopping. Four, help kids socially distance. Keep, it in a home, keep them at home to play. Avoid playgrounds and large group sports. Number five, help seniors socially distance by running errands for them, maybe shopping for them, but do not go visit them in a long-term care facility. We're trying to keep those folks separate. So please keep them separate. Uh, and then, of course, six, exercise daily at home or in a socially appropriate, uh, socially distance appropriate exercise. Uh, second, hospital data. We've talked a lot about all the restrictions we put in place and what that is about. It's about really trying to preserve our hospital system. Um, today, we've got 48% of our hospital beds available, 41%, I believe that, yep, 41% of the ICU beds available, and 76% of ventilators available. So what that demonstrates is that the steps we've taken to socially distance has worked to preserve our hospital capacity. We've got lots of capacity. And now as we gradually loosen restrictions, we're going to keep that in mind so we just do this a step at a time to make sure we continue to preserve that hospital capacity so that anybody who needs that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator can get access to it. That's the whole point of what we're doing. Uh, Test Nebraska. Again, we want people to sign up for testnebraska.com. This is how we're ramping up our testing across the state through mobile testing sites. We are in Omaha, Lincoln, Grand Island, and Schuyler today. So we are testing in those folks. Now, I know that some folks, we uh, loosened up some of the restrictions on testing to include people 65 or older. And so we had a lot of people who tried to sign up for that. I'd ask folks to continue to just be patient with us. Uh, as those slots got filled up, people were not able to schedule appointments. And so just keep trying back and uh, we will continue to work through that list of people to be able to get them tested through Test Nebraska. Uh, we've done uh, 22,943 tests so far, about 100 of uh, those, sorry, 2,943 tests have come back, and about 100 of those tests have been positive. And uh, we also yesterday swabbed 1,233 people. Uh, we also had asked a question about the timing of those tests coming back. So f just to, to be clear, first of all, separate from Test Nebraska are... Uh, turnaround time, the median turnaround time is two days. The mean or the average turnaround time for our public health labs and the private commercial labs and so forth, the hospital labs, is 2.89 days. So getting back to it's a little bit less than three days for us in general or an average to be able to turn around those tests from the public health lab and from the commercial labs and so forth. On testnebraska.com through May 9th, which is uh, kind of the most our recent data we had, 1.78 days on average to be able to turn around those tests. And then our best day for testnebraska.com so far has been 1.44 days, and our uh, longest time turning around was 2.37 days on average. So that's kind of, uh, kind of the time it's been taking to turn around those tests, both at the public health labs, across all the commercial labs, and then specifically separately from testnebraska.com. So that's uh, some of the information we have to update you on testnebraska.com. Uh, this is also police week. And of course, our law enforcement officers have been uh, keeping us safe forever. Uh, they, the men and women who put on the blue really sacrifice their time with their families. They put their lives at risk to keep us safe. And so we remember them um, National Police Week, and then actually it's National Law Enforcement Memorial Day on Friday as well. On Friday, uh, flags will be flown at half staff to remember those who have been lost in the line of duty. Last year, Trooper Jerry Smith from the Nebraska State Patrol was lost on June 20th, and we still remember him and keep him and his family in our prayers 
Uh, we mourn his loss of someone who had served our country, served our state, and was somebody who, again, was a model for that dedication of uh, to others over self. And so we, this is uh, this week. Normally, we would have had a celeb uh, not a celebration, but a, a ceremony on Friday to recognize uh, Trooper Smith being put on the wall in Grand Island. But that's not going to happen this year, obviously, because of social distancing. But we will still fly those flags at half staff. And uh, at this time, I'd like to call up uh, Colonel Bolduck to talk about all the great work that the Nebraska State Patrol has been doing throughout the course of the year, and specifically, um, you know, the, some of the things with regard to the pandemic. So, Colonel Bolduck. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Governor. Before I get into what our team is doing in response to COVID-19, I'd like to take a moment, uh, as the Governor did, to remember Trooper Jerry Smith, who we lost in the line of duty last June. Because of the COVID-19 measures, we're unable to honor him in the way that we normally would. Jerry's family and several of our troopers were supposed to be on their way to Washington, D.C. today for the National Law Enforcement Memorial Ceremony, which unfortunately uh, had to be canceled. Uh, but instead, there's going to be a virtual ceremony, which will be held uh, this week, and those events will be shared on the State Patrol's social media pages. So if you have an interest in observing that, please uh, check those links at uh, the Nebraska State Patrol uh, website. We were also scheduled to gather Friday at the Nebraska Law Enforcement Memorial in Grand Island to remember Jerry's service and all the others who have given their lives in the line of duty, including 11 other Nebraska State Troopers. That event also was canceled, but I had the opportunity to visit last Friday. Jerry's name is now on the memorial wall which will help us and all who come in the future remember his dedicated service to our state. So thank you, Governor, for uh, the proclamation this week for National Police Week and continuing to support law enforcement in this way. Our troopers continue to support the state's COVID-19 efforts in several ways, while at the same time keeping up with our daily efforts to help keep Nebraska safe. As we speak, we have dozens of troopers assisting in the efforts across the state. Many are part of teams traveling with the Nebraska National Guard to testing sites across the state. Our troopers' role at these sites is for security and support functions. We also have many troopers assisting in transporting test samples to the state lab here in Lincoln. Those relays are happening twice per day and make it possible for safe and secure transport of the samples while the test sites can continue operating to serve more Nebraskans. We've partnered with the National Guard many times before and are proud to work alongside them once again. At the same time, troopers and investigators continue working hard with the normal uh, caseload and crimes that occur. The same type of issues that we were handling before COVID-19, of course, are still, handle are still being uh, attended to today. One point of note that we've been tracking is excessive speeding. Since the directed health measure started on March 19th, our troopers have cited 177 motorists for traveling at speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. Needless to say, these types of speeds are dangerous for the driver and for the other motorists on the roadway. I'd like to thank Nebraskans for their voluntary compliance with the DHMs this compliance has kept other Nebraskans safe and has helped keep law enforcement officers safe at the same time. Thank you again, and thank you, Governor, and I'd be happy to answer any questions when the time comes. Great. Thank you very much, Colonel, and please uh, express my thanks to... <laughs> My thanks to your entire team doing a great job. We really appreciate all the work that everybody on your team is doing. So thanks. And, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I have something here for you. You just ran away before I forgot to sign it. Uh, hold on a second. Let me get this signed for you because I do have the proclamation proclaiming it National Police Week here in Nebraska. So let me sign this to make us official. So we are National Police Week in Nebraska. And please take that back. Great. Take orders. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and get into some of our questions and answers. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I got, uh, 
One other thing I want to mention, the National Guard tomorrow, May 13th, is going to be doing a flyover or a fly around the state to recognize uh, all the folks that have been involved in the healthcare industry and combating uh, coronavirus. So uh, tomorrow we're going to have um, a KC-135 Strato tanker for the 155th uh, wing here in Lincoln, fly and visit 14 different facilities, healthcare facilities around the state. If you want a schedule of where those are going to be, uh, you can check the National Guard's Facebook page. They'll list it out all there for you. So 14 different facilities are going to do a flyover to recognize all the healthcare workers who have been busy taking care of Nebraskans through this pandemic. So now getting into questions. Uh, Tara Campbell, WWT, with the Hispanic population continuing to see a disproportionately high number of confirmed cases of COVID-19, will you consider on-site testing in Latino communities such as South Omaha? So first of all, Tara, we have been doing this, um, not only in South Omaha, for example, One World has been doing uh, roughly about a, 100 tests a day, and we have been in conversations with them on how to ramp that up even higher and get them some assistance, for example, from the National Guard to give their uh, team a break. So we plan on continuing to do that, as well as in North Omaha. But we've also been in uh, Hispanic communities, uh, just broadly speaking, in, in helping do testing in places like Lexington or Grand Island or Dakota City or Crete or places like that. So we do recognize that uh, we've got a need here, and so we are looking to ramp those up, that up. If not, how will the state address concerns over the lack of internet access with the Hispanic community and therefore an inability to participate in Test Nebraska? So again, if you do want to fill out the Test Nebraska website you're in Spanish, you can go to testnebraska.com slash ES. Uh, the issue with regard to lack of internet access, however, is not unique to the Hispanic community. Um, there are a number of people who don't necessarily have that internet access. And that's, again, while we do, we do the regular testing we're doing, for example, with the Nebraska National Guard that continues to rotate around in different parts of the state. And again, if we're looking at like the solutions we're going to be doing for One World, that will not necessarily be a Test Nebraska solution. That will be something where you don't have to access through Test, test Nebraska to be able to do that. So we, we are allowing other channels for people to be able to get that testing done is not just testnebraska.com. But if you want to do it in testnebraska.com, that's a good thing, testnebraska.com slash ES. Okay, so Charlie Brogan, I've interviewed several seniors who received emails after signing up with Test Nebraska. It directs them to scheduling section of the program, but when they click on Lincoln, it tells them that there are no uh, times available and encourages them to check back another time. Is each testing station going to stay in operation as long as there are tests to conduct in that community? If so, uh, why wouldn't scheduling software give options for future dates, even if it is just a few days or a week into the future? So, uh, yeah, again, so these are mobile testing sites, so we mo will move them around the state. So while uh, there is one in Lincoln right now, that uh, one, I believe, will be moving at some point. So we schedule these. We have scheduling sites for a few days out. But again, a lot of those slots filled up when we went to people who were 65 or older. So again, we just asked for your patience for folks to continue to check, check back on the assessments and the opportunity to schedule those. We will continue to test people. So we've got lots of capacity to continue testing. We will, we will do it. But uh, please be patient for us as we, as we work through that. Uh, okay, Rex Kumpf, KJSK. Are you going to be issuing guidance in respect to county fairs and specifically 4-H livestock shows? So yes, we've got a team of folks who are working on coming up with some guidance with regard to county fairs for next month. So that is something that is in process. What is the timetable on auto racing tractor pulls? Uh, some states have allowed events like this with no fans. Is that a possibility or with a limited uh, fan participation? Uh, we actually are allowing some of that right now. Um, for example, in Grand Island at Fonner Park, they're doing horse racing without crowds. So that is going on right now. In fact, I think I read that that was like one of eight tracks in the country that was still operating. And then, at least at that time I read the article. And then the, um, we have done some auto racing where it was appropriately socially distanced with regards to the crews and everything. Again, there was no spectators allowed. So if you do have an event like that, I suggest just reach out to our the governor's office um, to make sure that you're going to be uh, complying with all the guidelines with regard to social distancing and that sort of thing. But we have allowed some events like this to go on. But again, limited circumstances, certainly no fans, limiting the amount of social interaction, all, you know, with those social distancing guidelines that we've established. Uh, and 402-471-2244 is the governor's office if you want to call in and uh, ask about that. Melanie Wilkinson, New York, the, from the New York News Times, 
are there any projections about whether or not the Cornhusker State Games were going to happen this year? And if so, how would that look? So, uh, and then she also has another one for the Seward Fourth of July uh, celebration as well. So, not we haven't done anything for July, so I don't have any information to be able to give you with regard to those. I can tell you we'll be doing social distancing for a while. There's some limitations on the size of crowds that will be gathering for a while. So we haven't come up with guidelines with regard to those two events. But again, you can expect that there's going to be, if those types of events are going to be going forward, there'll be limitations with regard to the number of people who can attend. Uh, but again, what we we'll want to do is, again, continue to see how, as we've loosened some of these restrictions here in this month, how that continues to um, go for us with regard to hospital capacity, and then we'll make some decisions with regard to June, and then we'll, in June we'll make decisions with regard to July. Ryan Boyd, KGFW. The directed health measures are slowly being altered as COVID-19 is continually tracked. Bars and restaurants are reopening with restrictions on things like capacity and only being seated if ordering food. What does the state think about the timeline for bars that only serve alcohol? Uh, that's, again, something that is under consideration. It will not be happening in the month of May. I can tell you that for sure. We will be taking a look at the data as we go through the month of May and making decisions about June based upon what we see happening in May. So I'd say just stay tuned with regard to bars that are not serving food, but they will not be, um, that will not be a step we will be taking in the month of May. Scott Carlson, North Platte Post. I've had numerous business owners in our community reach out to us and state that the local health department has told them that if they are not compliant with DHMs, they can be charged uh, criminally with misdemeanors. My question is, can private citizens really face criminal charges for operating a free business enterprise? So, Scott, yeah, again, in a time of emergency, when we issue these directed health measures, violating those measures is a Class 5 misdemeanor. So you can get ticketed for violating the DHM and get a Class 5 misdemeanor. However, I think that, first of all, the State Patrol has not ticketed anybody, right, Colonel? You haven't, so the State Patrol has not ticketed anybody for that. And the first step is not just to run out and have law enforcement jump in here. Uh, when I've been talking, for example, with mayors or other folks in uh, different parts of the state, what I've asked is, if you see somebody who's not following the rules or you think could do, be doing a better job, just reach out and call them call the manager, the owner, um, have, you know, if you're a, just a regular citizen, you can start by just talking to the manager. If you feel like that's not working, ask your mayor to make the phone call. I got to tell you, so many times when that's happened, the business has been accommodative, has taken more steps. And I always use the example of the mayor of Omaha, uh, Mayor Stothert, has worked with the big box stores in Omaha to get them to do, take more steps. They have, you know, when she reached out and called them, they were willing to do that. That's really the first course of action is to just open up those lines of communications, talk to people, ask them first to see if they can do a better job, and that's worked. Nebraskans do the right thing. So uh, certainly, like I said, there are legal ramifications to this, but that's not where we want to start. Brad Beam, KHAS Radio. Who makes the final decision on loosening the DHMs for the health districts? Is the final call made by the local health district, by someone at DHHS, by the governor? Will you walk us through the process when making the reopening decision? So what we do is we tend to work with the local public health department. So, for example, um, we made the announcement this week with regard to four of the public health districts that uh, loosened some of their DHMs prior to May 31st. Uh, we called and walked them through the process or walked them through their data with regard to hospital capacity, kind of just what was looking like with regard to the percent positives that were testing in their local public health district. Everybody was comfortable with loosening up those restrictions. And so um, then Dr. Antone, our chief medical officer, and myself, uh, I think actually sort of the one that signs the DHMs, but we ultimately try to make this a very collaborative process. At the end of the day, the buck does stop here at the governor's office uh, with the chief medical officer and I, because we're the ones that officially sign off on all these. The local public health departments can't do it on their own. Um, it has to be okayed by the state, so ultimately we do, but uh, we try to make it a collaborative process with those public health districts. Paul Hamill, Omaha World Herald. How many people via Test Nebraska who indicated that they have symptoms have been tested positive? So Paul asked this question yesterday. We checked into it. We actually don't track that data. So I'm sorry, Paul, you're not going to be able to get the answer to that question. We don't track it either in any of the regular testing we've been doing or in the Test Nebraska, so we don't really track that. 
How many people who test Nebraska said needed to be tested have been unable to schedule a test? Again, we don't track this one either. We just ask people to continue to be uh, patient with us and continue to try and get those tested. We had a lot of people trying, when we loosened up the restrictions, to allow people 65 or older. We had a lot of interest in getting those tests done. And so uh, just continue to check back with the site uh, to be able to get those time slots scheduled. And again, just a reminder, that's the only way that you can get tested is through scheduling it uh, for the testnebraska.com. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the expectation on when they might get tested? So again, we're working through the process. Uh, there's lots of people. I think we've talked about over 135,000 people have signed up. It's probably more now. So uh, lots of people. Again, uh, we're continuing to ramp up the amount of testing. We swabbed uh, 12, over 1,200 people yesterday. But you can see it's going to take some time to be able to work through this. So continue to check back on the site. Uh, what is the update on adding people at the call center? Uh, have more been added, and when will that happen? This has kind of happened this last weekend, so we're still working through that process for how we're going to do that uh, with regard to ramping up the capacity at the call center, so I don't have an answer to give you on that. And a reader says that when they access the portable to get the results of their test, they were asked instead to schedule a new test. Is that a glitch that has been common? Is it fixed? Actually, that is the first time we've heard that one, Paul, so you can ask that reader to reach out to our office to get the details on that, because that, that is one I have not heard yet with regard to going back on to get your test result, and then being asked to schedule a, an appointment. Also a reader question uh, from Paul Hamill. What can the governor do to prevent a price gouging at, by meat uh, packers at, for a price of beef? Prices at grocery store have gone up while cattle producers get less, he says. So this is uh, an issue that has not just been with regard to this pandemic. You may all recall that we had that fire in Holcomb, Kansas, at a facility there, a meat processing facility there. Uh, that actually spurred the U.S. Department of Agriculture to start an investigation with regard to the practices um, and how the pricing was being set for box beef versus what our cattle producers were getting for it and so forth. And also our attorney general has requested with, I believe, 10 other states to uh, send a letter in to the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice, to do an investigation with regard to uh, pricing with reg in this industry. And uh, just a few days ago, President Trump also asked the Department of Justice to look into this. So uh, this, is an, this is a known issue, and the Department of Justice, I presume, is doing the investigation on the industry with regard to uh, pricing and how that's working between the price that the packing industry is charging other people versus what they're paying for the producers who are bringing the cattle. Taylor, where are you? Taylor, you got any questions for us that were texted in? Bill Schammer would like to know um, many bars feel that they're being treated unfairly. Do you think they'll be able to provide June 1st and what factors have been staying close? So, Bill Schammer uh, says, hey, bars feel like they're being treated unfairly, and do we think they'll be open by June 1st and what factors will play into that? Again, just what we said before is that we're uh, going to be reviewing the data here in May and we'll be giving guidelines for June. Bars will not be opening up in this month. I, that decision has been made. But we will be looking at the factors with regard to how stable the hospital system is and so forth, and looking at do we think that this is something that we think we're stable enough that we can start making loosening other restrictions, potentially on bars as well. So I'd say stay tuned on that one. We'll, just, we'll be making that decision based upon what we see uh, this month. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, why are bars being treated differently from restaurants? And it really gets to that idea of social distancing. I mean, if you think about just when you've gone to a crowded restaurant, everybody, even in a crowded restaurant, people are typically sitting down at tables where there's some separation. And of course, what we've done with the DHM is we've made that mandatory. There's got to be a six-foot distance between the table and the next table. We put in other uh, restrictions on that as well. Now, think about the most crowded bar you've ever been to. Was there six feet of distance between anybody? They were, it was all very close. And again, this is the whole thing. So taking us back over a couple of months ago, when we started getting briefed on what uh, fighting a pandemic looks like, part of it was really the big key, limiting size of groups of people that are mixing together, because that's how the virus spreads. So this is one of the reasons why, for example, schools were one of the first things that started operating without students, because that's the most highly concentrated place in our society where people get together, is when kids are in a school building. And bars aren't that far, after, <laughs> that, that, that far behind, right? So you have a lot of people in a bar. And so because that's such a dense concentration of people, that's why 
bars have been treated differently from restaurants, because restaurants, even though, and again, remember, we took steps on restaurants, too, to not allow dine-in originally, but we've released it to 50% capacity, and again, it's a step. So we've been taking this, as, as we've been loosening restrictions, we've been doing a step at a time to make sure that we're not going to let the virus get that, you know, spike back up and overwhelm the healthcare system. So again, we're doing this a bit at a time. Bars are more concentrated groups of people, so that's why they've been remaining closed, whereas restaurants, we allow to go to a 50% capacity. Yeah, Lee. You did the uh, Kickstarter sort of thing with the contact tracing, how you had the teams sent out, or at the call center, rather, to do their work. Can you kind of give an update on how that progression has been and what the feedback has been from the people that have been reached out to and like how that self-isolation has been playing out? Yeah, so uh, let me again take a step back here. So historically, typically, Local public health departments are responsible for doing the contact tracing and asking people to quarantine and isolate. Typically, most of the public health departments will have maybe seven to 15 people that they can devote to that. And in some cases, it's even fewer number of people. So what we did is we stood up our team at the Department of, uh, or in a lot of DHHS, a lot of Department of uh, Health and Human Services people, were stood up to be able to help be a supplement to the local public health department. They're still directing how those resources are being used. We're just supplementing those. So we've got about 250 of our teammates that are now trained up and deployed on call center teams to assist the local public health departments to do that. And the public health departments have been very help, very thankful for the extra help to be able to do that contact tracing and um, you know getting that person who's been tested positive to or to isolate, getting everybody else contacted so they can start monitoring their systems and quarantine and so forth. The feedback I got so far is that the public health departments are very pleased. Um, obviously, you know, we're reaching out and getting to people. There's some other things that we think we can improve upon, uh, you know, with regard to how that information that we collect is getting fed back to the public health departments and so forth. So we're still kind of working out the system, but so far the reviews I think have been very good from the local public health departments who are responsible for doing this, and they appreciate the extra resources to be able to make sure that we're trying to get to people as quickly as possible. Still been, you know, there's some places where we got to make sure we're continuing to have good um, information flow back and forth, and we got to develop some systems to be able to do that. But so far, I would say the reviews have been positive. So the question is, what about compliance? Have people been doing it? And again, typically, I don't know that we have data on that per se, but we do do follow-up. Do you have, actually, Dr. Anton, do you have? I don't have any data, but uh, I do get follow-up, and they yeah. enter whether they're asked to monitor or not. They're asked to enter into a text message or into a database on, on the community guidelines. Yeah. Um, so we do follow-up phone calls with people. Um, they're asked to monitor their phone. 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 They're So the question is, uh, why is contact tracing important if you can't actually track whether it's happening or not? I think it's, imp again, what we have found through this entire pandemic is when you ask Nebraskans to do the right thing, they do the right thing. So when we ask people to stay home, I'm thinking it's going to be the same deal, that when we've asked people to do the right thing, they understand that it's a public health risk to go out and potentially spread the virus. And we're calling them to remind them. But at the end of the day, we don't have enough police to be able to go out and enforce it that we sit in everybody's doorstep. So that's why we ask people to comply. That, and that's really been our entire approach throughout this entire pandemic. We don't have enough police to sit on everybody's doorstep. What we need, and I'm sure Colonel Blanc will agree, he doesn't want to sit on anybody's doorstep. So what we need is people to comply voluntarily. We need them to do the right thing. And Nebraska has been doing the right thing. So while there probably are people who we call and ask to isolate or quarantine and they don't do it, I'm going to give you a guess that, by and large, Nebraskans do the right thing, and they have been doing it. And we're going to have Felicia here in a couple days to talk about contact tracing specifically, so she can probably get into more detailed questions. So Lee, hold those questions. She'll come back and get you more details. And now we know what you're going to ask, so we're going to warn her, okay? <laughs> Martha.
Nebraska team going to other states to play games? Yeah, so the question was with regard to uh, baseball and softball tournaments after June 18th, what about teams that are maybe coming here from other states and about Nebraskans going to other states to play tournaments? And I would say that, you know, with regard to the tournaments that are going on here, they will have to be conducted in the same way to comply with the guidelines. So if you're, so we talked about in the guidance specifically about how games are to be operated. If you're going to do tournaments, again, you're going to have to follow all those same sort of guidelines, except on a bigger scale. So you're going to have to keep all the teams separate. There's going to be separate areas for them. Spectators are only going to be allowed uh, to stand or bring their own chairs. They're not going to be allowed to send the bleachers because the teams are going to have to be doing the bleachers. So all the, when you're done with the field, you're going to have to sanitize everything So before the new team comes in. So all those, those sorts of things. And same thing, if a team is coming in from out of state, they're going to have to comply with all those sort of standards. And if a Nebraska team is going elsewhere, um, you know, I would encourage them to follow the same sort of standards that are either going to be in that state or, you know, using those good social distancing guidelines. Um, you know, again, I would ask them to use common sense and good judgment. So don't go play a tournament necessarily in places like New Jersey and New York where we know that there's still a lot of virus floating around. But if you're going to South Dakota, I don't know that anybody's, you know, by late June, I don't know that anybody's going to be too concerned if a, a baseball team is traveling to South Dakota. So, right, so the question was, well, what about the 14-day quarantine? The quarantine that we put out there extends through the month of May. Obviously, if we re-extend that through June, we'll have to give some guidance for regard, regard to baseball teams that are coming into the state. But right now, the 14-day uh, quarantine applies to people who are coming in, uh, you know, through the month of May. Mark Bomber, KSMB, uh, has a, a listener who called in and said, I got a stimulus check for my deceased mother. What should I do to return that? That, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, that would be a great question for uh, our uh, Department of Revenue to <laughs> help us out with. So um, maybe we get Tony Fulton to answer that, Taylor, and maybe you can just respond back to him directly. So the question is, are we open to expanding mobile testing in South Omaha beyond One World? And we're going to be you know, taking a look at a lot of different solutions. I think that uh, in talking to the folks at One World, for example, they thought it would be better to be doing it there because it's a trusted face in the community. And I tend to agree with them on that. Uh, we will have other mobile testing sites in Omaha, and certainly those are not exclusive, so that if people in South Omaha wanted to use those, they'd be able to use those as well. And we will be moving around those sites as uh, you know, sites right now. CHI Health Center, for example, is. Um, where we're, we've got people located. So uh, we will be, you know, adapting our testing to suit the conditions. Yeah? How many hospital, or how many COVID-19 patients are in the hospital right now? Do you have a percentage of how many of those patients are hospitalized? So the question is, uh, how many patients are in COVID-positive patients are in hospitals right now? Is it 184? What is it, Dr. Antone? 192 today. 192 patients in area hospitals out of a total of 3,800 some beds that we've got. So the percentage is relatively small. And I'm sorry, was there another percentage you were asking for? How many? Yeah. What is the percentage of COVID-19 patients in Nebraska that have needed hospitalized? So the last number, I'm going to actually call Dr. Anton to talk about this more in detail. But the last time I checked was roughly about 5 or 6% was the hospitalization rate for uh, coronavirus patients. Is that about right? So do you want to come up and say anything else? Dr. Anton, you haven't been up here in a while. You probably should come here and talk. <laughs> yeah, besides, besides the dashboard that we have out on our DHH website, we have our, our own little dashboard that we keep track of on a daily basis. And, and at this time, you know, we're watching it very closely because of the elective surgeries starting back up a couple of weeks ago and then again this Monday and then again probably next week. So I've seen uh, the data change maybe one or two percent both ways. So we are seeing a little bit more of an increase in the COVID positive patients in the Douglas County area, the Douglas County uh, Health Department, but really not a major change as far as percentage goes. As the governor mentioned, 
We have 192 COVID positive patients throughout the state of Nebraska in the hospitals right now. Of that, Douglas County has 89 of those patients. And I do keep track of the, call the CMOs and talk to the CMOs of the major hospitals throughout the state. If anything, the rural part of the state or the non-eastern non part of the state is very, very stable at this time. We used to mention about Lexington, Grand Island, uh, Kearney, Norfolk, very, very stable at this time. So right now we're sort of concentrating on, on the Douglas County area and the Lincoln-Lancaster area, but our capacity is great. We still have, as the governor mentioned, 75% ventilator capacity, even in those areas. So, uh, Sioux as well? Yes, Sioux City, I was in contact with my counterpart from Iowa, the state health official from Iowa yesterday. And obviously we've offered our help right up front for Sioux City, Iowa, because the patients that were on Sioux City, Nebraska side of the river use the Sioux City, Iowa hospitals, and they have transferred down some of the patients to the Omaha area, but they've also transferred some patients within their own system in Iowa. And right now, the, the state health official I talked to yesterday from Iowa, so that area is starting to stabilize out now too. Yes? So the question is, has we, have we seen our peak and it's passed now? I don't want to say that because I see all the models say that we keep pushing our peak back, but as the governor keeps mentioning, we have definitely flattened that peak, no doubt about it, and especially as far as healthcare resources go. We have maintained our healthcare resources throughout all this, and I can only thank all the hospital CEOs, CMOs, public health directors, they're the ones that really did it. I mean, when, when the situation happened in Grand Island, when the situation happened in Lexington, even when the situation happened in Sioux City, they did an excellent job of keeping things under control. And everybody collaborated as far as putting a hand in to help. There was no, nobody that wasn't, uh, didn't want to help out, let me put it that way. So I don't know about our peak. I'm an optimist. I want to say we've handled it great up until this time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the same thing going forward. And also add all the nurses and doctors who uh, worked very hard to be able to manage all that too. So, Fred. For Colonel. Colonel. Sir. Great, thank you. So the question was, uh, how does the increase in speeders over 100 miles an hour compare to uh, what would be normal, uh, say, several months ago? Uh, I don't have a percentage increase, but I can tell you that it's a substantial increase. If we look at the data from the Department of Transportation, we're seeing that traffic counts are very low. And we all can see that. If we drive from here to Omaha, we see the interstate has very little traffic. Uh, other than commercial uh, motor vehicles. So uh, it, it is a, a, an assumption that in part because of the lower traffic volumes, the opportunity exists for uh, people to speed. Now, what possesses someone to go greater than 100 miles per hour? Uh, it would be only a guess on my part and uh, it probably would be wrong. But uh, we just need to stress that uh, it, it's not safe to travel at those speeds uh, on our interstates, and we would just ask folks to be mindful of uh, the other motorists that are out there. I just wonder if the troopers are reporting that people are feeling cooped up, so they're getting out. You know, that would be a fair uh, assumption, I think, under the current circumstances, but the feedback that we're getting from those uh, folks who are deserving of our intervention uh, just to really don't seem to have any rhyme or reason to it. Uh, I think the opportunity is there and some folks are taking advantage of it, but we are out there. Uh, we're still enforcing, uh, you know, the guidance we gave to our folks was let's make sure that we enforce the, the obvious uh, egregious violations and, and certainly we've asked our law enforcement officers to use great discretion uh, to make fewer contacts. That's, that's not a secret. Uh, you know, the, the less contact we have with the public, the safer the public is and the safer uh, our officers are, 
but still we have to do our job and we have to make sure the motoring public is safe and really go after those obvious uh, safety violations that, that tend to be out there. Sir. Thank you. So the question is, you know, what has it been like for, for our, our troopers, our staff, to uh, go through this uh, unprecedented uh, experience? Uh, it's definitely different. I, I can say that uh, the morale of the troopers is high, but they're also anxious, like everybody else, to, be, to have this thing get over with, you know, whenever that might be. You know, you have to remember, you know, that our troopers, our dispatchers, our, our civilian staff that are supporting this team, we are all community members like you all, and we have families, and we have kids that are not in school, and we have spouses that may or may not be working uh, or working from home. So all the, the common experiences that everybody else is experiencing right now, our troopers are experiencing that as well. And then you add the stress of being a law enforcement officer, which, don't get me wrong, this is a, a profession we've all chosen, and we're, we're proud to do it. But those cumulative stresses, uh, you know, just add an extra measure of challenge. Uh, but I can tell you that our, our team is up for the challenge, and they are still proud to serve Nebraska. And, and frankly, uh, if I can brag on them, I think they're doing a fabulous job. And uh, we're like you, uh, anxious for this thing to be over. Ma'am? So the question is, uh, you know, how did we end up, you know, changing some of the roles that we're doing and, and how have we adapted to that? Um, you know, really, you know, you've heard the governor talk about uh, the team that we have here in Nebraska, all of the uh, employees at the state of Nebraska, we, we look at it as one big team, and how they've really stepped up and I think have innovated and have worked together. You know, our, our troopers and staff are no different. Uh, we need security at these mobile testing sites around the state. Uh, okay, let's figure it out in a hurry. Now, fortunately, our troopers are well-trained and they're used to solving problems. In fact, they, they do a great job of it and they, they take a lot of pride in that. So here's a challenge that we have. How do we keep our National Guard partners and the healthcare providers safe and, and helping moving them efficiently around the state? It's a problem to be solved and, and they just have jumped right in. Um, with the escorting the test samples from Grand Island and Omaha and other places. Uh, call from NEMA, Nebraska Emergency Management. Hey, can you guys help with this? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're there. We're mobile. We're, we're not working from home. We're working from our squad cars. Uh, it's, a, it's a mission that's important. We've got to get those samples to the lab. Let's make it happen. Uh, other challenges. But it's not unlike what we faced last year. We had floods, we had rescues that had to be affected. Uh, we normally drive a car, now we have troopers driving boats, right? And you just adapt and you, you solve the problems as they come at you, and then you take a look at it afterwards and learn what you can for the next problem that comes up that perhaps you hadn't had a chance to practice. And so that's really the, the case here. Let's take the challenges as they come and let's uh, work together as a team not just law enforcement, law enforcement, healthcare, National Guard, or other state teammates, uh, whoever is needed to get the job done. Have you had any of your officers or members of your team fall ill to COVID from line of duty interaction? Uh, thank you for the question. The question is, has any of our teammates fallen ill uh, as a result of COVID? And the answer is no, thankfully. Uh, we've had several that needed to isolate because of customers they were dealing with who didn't necessarily want to go to jail, said, hey, I have COVID thinking that's a free pass. It's not, by the way. Um, so we promptly tested those folks who said that they were ill and then tested our, our folks who interacted with them and fortunately found that none have tested positive. So we're very thankful for that, but we're also uh, of the mindset that we have to be aware that it is here, it's in our community, it's, uh, it, somebody may unknowingly 
be affected and be carrying it. So we have to use all uh, proper precaution when we're dealing with members of the public. So did any of the people who claimed they were uh, sick in the airport? Yes, did any of the folks who claimed they were ill actually, were they ill? And the answer is no. They're thankfully very healthy too. Ma'am. I have a more dated question. That's not. Oh. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carl. All right, so Dr. Anton, I'm gonna call you back up again. The question was, how many uh, COVID positive patients are on ventilators or in the ICU? And updated nursing home data. I do have the nursing, the question is, is about updated nursing home data. Can I get the hospital data first and then I have the nursing home data on my piece of paper down at the, I don't have the memory of the governor, so I have to have it written down. But, uh, that we have a total now of 56 COVID positive patients on a ventilator in the state of Nebraska. As you remember, I mentioned we have 192 total patients. So it's about one fourth of patients that are actually hospitalized need to have an ICU and a ventilator. And then an additional about 25 patients in the ICUs that are not on a ventilator. You want to talk about so. how many total ventilators? Yeah, we have a total of 784 ventilators in the state of Nebraska, and right now 599 of those ventilators are available for use. Only 7% of ventilators in the state of Nebraska are used for COVID positive patients today. And let me get the data for long-term care. I can read it. Okay. 292 residents. 218 staff. and 62 deaths for long-term care residents. Yes, Lee. That 7% that you talked about, do you have an idea how this compares to surrounding states that maybe have similar um, bed capacity, so to speak, that we do in other states? Like, how does it compare to ours, just so people kind of have an idea of what 7% really is that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. 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 Yeah, I don't know that answer, but I, I'd like to know it myself, so I'll find out for you. Yes, Martha. Well, I have a question, but I don't know whether you or the governor would prefer to handle it. But. I prefer the governor, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> Try it on him first. Okay. Um, when you're looking, looking at the data and trying to decide how are things going with the opening up, what measure are you going to, to look at? I mean, when you look at, you're looking at the hospital capacity, but do you say, oh, when we get to 75% capacity or when we get to 95% capacity, that's when we better start doing something different? I mean, is there... So Martha asks, what, what number, what capacity number are we going to start saying, yes, we're getting overloaded again and maybe not having the capacity? And the numbers we usually quote are our, our statewide numbers, but we're really keeping track on a hospital basis now. And I will be keep doing that personally, be keeping track of the percent of beds available, percent of ICU beds available, and percent of ventilators available in each specific hospital throughout the state. And that's what we did for the sort of the non- eastern part of the state. Now we'll be concentrating on Douglas County and Lincoln. And it's 30%. We set the guidelines for 30% bed capacity, 30% ICU bed capacity, and 30% ventilator capacity in each hospital. So those are the numbers we'll use. So, so once, you, once you're down to 30%, then you say we better start shutting up down again? I, I presume that's what we'll do. We'll say maybe stop doing some elective surgeries. But again, all the hospitals, CEOs, CMOs, they've been great about this. They, they did not ramp up right away. They ramped up very slowly. And like I said, watching it over this last two weeks, I've, I've noticed only a 1% or 2% change in all those numbers that we've had. So, you know, obviously it's going to get a little bit higher as things go on. But we haven't seen a big surge or anything like that as we've relaxed those directive health measures to allow elective surgeries. Yes. Why are they seeing such a high rate of deaths? What can they do more of the deaths there? 
So uh, the question is, is why are two thirds of the deaths basically that we've had, we've had 100 deaths now uh, from nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities. It's all about ventilator, or excuse me, it's all about lung capacity. Even not, even not only in elderly patients, but even in patients that are obese or have pulmonary issues, it's all about lung capacity. Your lungs can only oxygenate and ventilate or get rid of carbon dioxide to a certain extent. The older you get, the harder that is to do. And the more comorbidities you have that affect your lungs, the harder that is to do. So if a patient were to need a ventilator, the, the issue is getting off that ventilator. And if you don't have that lung capacity to get off the ventilator, that's why you, you don't live. And again, the, the word, yeah, the question is, is we're at 48% now of uh, bed capacity. That's statewide. We're going to be watching it on a hospital-by-hospital hospital basis. But if there, if there were a hospital that was 48% full, it would have to go up another 22% to hit. I just want to make sure I understand. That's correct. Okay. It would have to go up to at 30% or, or not, not have 30% capacity. Exactly, yeah. Would it be fair to say that um, unless we reach that, that measure of that 30%, you can expect to see consistent changes with restrictions being lifted and, so to speak, if we don't get to those numbers? Uh, so the question is, is if, as we get close to that 30% rule and we think things are getting better, is that what you're asking, Lee? Are we going to extend that to 20% rather than 30%? I'm going to leave that one for the governor, but I, I don't know. Yeah, so again, we're going to watch what's happening uh, with regard to the hospital system. And so we're, again, I think as Dr. Anton says, it's going to be on a hospital-by-hospital hospital basis. So we've asked hospitals, for example, to maintain 30% of their capacity right now. And as we get more experience with this, yeah, we might drop that down to 20% or 10%. It just, but we're going to, you know, again, look and see what happens with the data over time to get kind of a feel for how we're being able to manage the healthcare system and do it on a hospital-by-hospital hospital basis. Yeah, Brandon. I know the Secretary of State will um, provide an update tomorrow, but have you had any sort of feedback or contact with him about the election and how things have been going and if there's any issues? So the question was, has there been any, have I had any contact with the Secretary of State about the election today and any feedback on how things are going? I have not talked to the Secretary, so I do not know um, how things are going. I can tell you, based on my small experience, I went to vote today, and I was, I showed up right at 8 o'clock. I was the only person there to vote. Uh, when I turned around to the left, there was one other person walking in. Usually there's a line at <laughs> my polling place. So I am guessing that many people took advantage of the opportunity to uh, be able to send in an early ballot and drop it off at their county box or, you know, drop box or whatever. So I, I'm not anticipating that there are going to be any issues. As you know, we did uh, make the National Guard ready to be able to step in in case there was a shortage of poll workers any place. But uh, I got to tell you, I probably would have heard something if something was going on. Couple more questions. Okay, well, I'm not going to make everybody sit here in silence. Um, thank you very much again, everybody, for coming here to be able to talk about what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. I want to thank again all the Nebraskans who are working so hard to be able to, uh, you know, make those sacrifices to slow down the spread of the virus here in Nebraska. It is absolutely working. We've got to continue to do this. Again, this is something we're going to be doing for a while, but I appreciate everybody's participation, and we will uh, get, continue to have these press briefings the rest of the week. Uh, weekdays, 2 p.m. Central Time, right here. We'll be doing our Spanish language briefings at 5 p.m. Central Time, Tuesday and Thursday. I'll be on NET, speaking of Nebraska, with Dennis Kellogg, 8.30 Thursday night. And I believe we've got uh, Dr. Ashraf is going to be there. He's going to be there talking about what we're, uh, long term care facilities, and I think there'll be another guest who's not been determined yet. So, uh, but please tune in for that. Thank you all again, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.